Hello, members. This is Tom Morrison all the way here from Nashville, Tennessee with MTI Connect today and uh, coming right here from Nashville. And we're here to talk about in, uh, technical standards today. I want to encourage everybody listening in to just really dig in. And uh, MTI's got, got so much stuff going on. We've got training going on um, with the labor issues going on in the world. It's imperative that you have your management teams trained on how to treat your employees and how to manage, lead them well. And uh, technical training for all your line personnel. So we've got lots of great things going on. But today, we're here to talk about technical standards with all of our team of what I call the big experts. they got everything you need to know about what's going on in these rooms of uh, standards meetings with NADCAP, AMEC, CQI9. And I want to let everybody know that on the, on your, uh, the bottom, you'll see a chat box that you can click. And you can see if it'll pop up. I'll put hello members, where are you listening from? Would love to you just type in where you're listening from as well as if you have any questions as you hear uh, the team speak, feel free to jot your questions in there and we will answer those questions. I'll be monitoring those. So, but we're glad you're listening in today. I got lots going on in this world. And uh, so let's start with a few little introductions. Uh, we, we're welcoming Steve Keckler and Joanna Lease. I know y'all are all familiar with Ed, Robert and, and Bob, but for anybody new, I'll just call your names out. Give like a 15, 20 seconds of, uh, of what y'all do for the team. So Bob Ferry, you're one of the co-chairs, you start us off. Okay, so um, Bob Ferrier with FPM and um, is certainly, I'm involved in CQI9 and uh, NADCAP, AMAC, um, but a lot of the standards committees um, to try to, you know, determine what's uh, on the horizon for us and to try to put some uh, common sense into the standards that, you know, heat treaters can live by. So that's me. Is common sense and standards, isn't that an oxymoron? <laughs> <laughs> All right, Mr. Ed. Hi, uh, Ed Engelhard with Solar Atmospheres. Uh, pretty involved in uh, NADCAP, uh, ASTM, and uh, AMEC <clears throat> these days. And uh, I'll bring you an update or help, help Bob bring you an update on the NADCAP. Uh, and by the way, I'm also involved in Medicred, if any of you were doing that uh, program. Uh, and uh, Rob Peters and I will do the uh, AMAC report out. Still a lot of activity there as well. Awesome. Robert? Hi, Robert Peters. I'm a consultant. Uh, I'm involved as with AMAC. Uh, and the Additive Manufacturing 3D Printing Powdered Metal Fusion Bonding Committee. And we write all the specs for that. Um, as uh, Ed was saying about AMAC, you know, it's... Uh, we write a lot of good specifications and we need a lot of good feedback from people on it to make sure that these specs fit what we do in this industry. Awesome, Robert. Thank you for all your work. Joanna, Lisa, how about you? How are you doing today? I'm good. Thank you for asking. Hope you guys are all doing well also. Uh, Johanna Lisa, Continental Heat Treating, Quality Heat Treating. I'm also the AQS NMC representative and uh, been involved in the NADCAP system for 20 plus years now. And I'll be providing the NMC update today. Thank you, Joanna. And last but not least, Stephen Keckler. I'm Stephen Keckler with Thermtech and I sit on ASTM committee E28, which is going to be helping cover things like uh, mechanical testing and hardness. Well, you know, it, it's great to have all six of you. I know a lot of, a lot of, um, people didn't for years recognize what the AMEC committee was. And we really tried to understand it. When I'd say, hey, you wanna be involved in writing the standards that you have to get audited to, and they give me like a blank stare, not really understanding. So those aren't made by little elves or something in the sky, these engineers that just <laughs> get up there and, and like, no, they're written by people just like you. So, uh, so that's a big deal to keep in mind is that, you know, we have very good people at the table uh, debating. Um, there's nothing like having 35 engineers who all think they're right debating a spec over if, shall, may, and will. You know, so it's a lot of fun to sit there and watch that. Sometimes it can be very entertaining and, and even at the NADCAP world. So I'm glad everybody's here listening in. Uh, so Bob, Bob Ferry, I know CQI9's got some stuff going on as it's come out of its revision four. So what's the latest going on there? Yeah, um, so certainly with CQI9, um, they're still going through some of the um, the questions and um, concerns that were sent in uh, as people continue to use the standard. And um, so they'll send in a question and they'll want some clarification on it. And, and uh, so we meet as a committee and we go through those questions and we get answers and we respond to whoever sent the questions in. Um, 
So we, we continue to encourage you to, to do, continue doing that. You can send it directly to AIAG, the CQA9 committee, or if you want, you, you know, send an email to myself and I'll make sure that it gets to the committee and it gets on the docket and we get it addressed. Um, but that's kind of what they're doing. Uh, the next meeting is gonna be in April. Um, so it's coming up pretty soon. And uh, the other work that we're looking at is um, we broke into separate sections for uh, doing the process tables. And so some of the, the wording in the process tables isn't exactly the same in process table A as it is in process table D, because there were different people in different um, working on these different process tables. So long story short, uh, some of the wording isn't exactly the same and somebody pointed that out. So we're taking another look at the process tables to see if we have to get those uh, um, wordsmithed to where they, um, they're uniform amongst all of them, right? Without losing um, the integrity of what, what we're trying to get across in the, uh, in the statements. So that's kind of what's going on with uh, CQN right now. Um, it's, it was hot and heavy before we released the revision, but now it's, it's backed off a little bit uh, as far as meetings. So we're not, we haven't been meeting every month, but it's like every other month we're meeting now and um, we continue going through that. So Bob, I got a big question for you. I mean, CQ9 seems to be one of those things that comes in periodically and they dip in and do some revisions and dip out and don't do any for a while. So is there anything in, in your world that you hear on the forefront of things heat shooters ought to be thinking about, things that may concern you or things they're talking about that aren't, they should be on the radar screen or is, or is everything pretty much kind of even kill? Well, I mean, the, the, um, the, the things that it's, that's on the radar screen for CQ9 right now are they're looking at additional processes to add additional process tables um, for centering, for brazing, um, different heat treat processes like that. Because what they're trying to do is to make sure that um, they're managing the OEM's requirements uh, for these processes as well. So we do have a process table on center hardening but it really doesn't cover the centering part of, um, of that process. Uh, and Ford would like to add that into the, um, into the CQI-9. So they're gonna pick up these additional processes as we move forward um, as a committee. Right, well one of the things for people listening in, if this, if this is in, in, your, in your world of your industries you service, if you go to heattreat.net, our website heattreat.net, and then click down the benefits, click on the heat treat, the benefits tab at the top, you click on the heat treat live, you'll come up with all of our past listings. And it was just about four or five months ago that Bob Ferry and the gentleman from General Motors did a nice webcast like we're doing today on all the things happening with the CQI-9 standard. So that's a, way, that's a nice 45 minute piece for you to go back and listen here right from the people who helped derive that standard, uh, what's happening there. So that's another resource members can tap into. Great. Is there anything else, Bob? No, that's it for uh, for my report out. Awesome, appreciate it. All right, so now let's go to ASTM with Stephen Keckler. Stephen, what's going on with the ASTM meetings? So right now, there's really just two mainline items that are uh, potentially going to affect us coming forward. One of them's a, uh, a ballot that's up for ASTM E8, so that's going to be like red temperature tensile testing, and specifically, um, there's a ballot push right now to make it mandatory that when tensile properties are reported that both the elongation percentage, but then the actual diameter um, of the tensile bar is reported, or sorry, not diameter, the actual length, the actual gauge length is reported. Um, currently right now that's not required in most circumstances per the spec. Um, if that changes, you'll have to change how your reporting is in order to have conformance there. And then the other big one that's on the table right now is regarding E18, so it's gonna affect your rock wall testing. And there's a ballot push right now to make it required to uh, report, if you're con doing a scale conversion, so from like HRC to HRB, doesn't quite work that way, but in either case, you would have to report the scale inspected in and the scale you're reporting. Um, currently, that's not mandatory in E18. That is mandatory per E140, but it's not followed very often. 
And then the other thing regarding E18 that's up is that if you are doing a convex roundness correction, there's a ballot push to make it where you would have to report whether or not you're doing the correction. And if you are, what's, what source are you pulling that correction value from? Um, currently right now, um, the ballot is to see whether or not that will move forward with those changes before it goes to the main E28 committee. Um, but even if it gets struck down this time, it isn't the first time that both, either of these items have come up and I expect they'll come up again. So um, just keep yourself aware of that. If you can start maybe thinking about ways that you can integrate that into your system if it does eventually go forward. Um, otherwise, you know, vote your, Vote how you feel it would work. There's a lot of people who are concerned that this will have negative impacts for the, their relationship with their customers as far as making them understand whether or not, you know, are the results you're getting, are they reliable, what's going on, why am I seeing two different numbers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, so Stephen, do you have any, any um, kind of gut feeling as to whether it will uh, pass or not pass or how that happens? Um, it hasn't, this is, it has failed to move forward. I think this is the third or fourth time that this particular ballot initiative for E18 has failed to move forward. It's likely it will fail to move forward again. Um, but like I said, I don't expect that it's going to go away. I'm sure that it will keep coming up in ballot um, because there is a chunk of individuals who are um, very dedicated to wanting it in there. Um, and from a NAGCAP perspective, my understanding is that this is more or less required anyways. Um, the E8, I'm not as sure about. Um, there's some people who are strongly opposed to it and other people who don't really um, seem to sense there being any issue with it. So we'll have to see where that goes. Balloting is closed on the E8 initiative. So we should get the report back on that probably in the next couple months, I would assume. I'm curious, is there a short answer as to why the, the chunk of people are pushing it so hard, why they're wanting it? Um, the theory being it will provide reporting clarity as far as how exactly um, numbers were generated. That way the end customer can go back and double check if they want to. Um, it's really just a, um, it's, it's all a push for transparency or at least supposed transparency. Right. Awesome. Any, anything else to follow up with that? Anything, any closing comments? Um, that's all I have at this time. Okay. That sounds good. Thank you very much for that. So Ed and Robert, AMEC, the monster, tons of specs. What's going on in the world of AMEC? Well, we're uh, <clears throat> doing some adjustments to uh, three of the AMS 2759 specs, uh, slash one, slash two, and slash seven. <clears throat> Most of it is fairly minor. Uh, we're nickel and diming ourselves to pieces on <clears throat> how to phrase things like snap tempers and uh, preheat treat or pre uh, hardening, preheating, and that sort of thing. But uh, after uh, many rounds of discussions, I think we've finally resolved and they've gone to ballot, and some are done and some are coming up due very soon here. The voting right. looks like it's all pretty steadily uh, on track to approve. Um, next in line uh, after those three will be uh, 2801. I'm sponsoring that. <clears throat> That's the uh, titanium parts heat treatment. Rev B is the current street version. If everybody that has ever had to deal with it, it complains about it and rightfully so. Uh, revision C is gonna be a lot more straightforward all of that approach to temperature stuff's coming out. Uh, the language is getting cleaned up and it's being formatted to look like all the other AMS specs. So uh, I'm not sure when that's gonna roll out, but uh, I'm finishing up addressing the last of the T comments that have come up of late. And uh, you know, maybe with some luck, we'll see a, a clean sheet of uh, 2801 Rev C come out, be kind of nice. Uh, 2772, which is aluminum raw materials, is being balloted right now. Um, I don't get involved with aluminum, but those of you who do and may be required to heat treat the 2772, uh, keep an eye out for it. Again, it looks a lot like fine tuning more than any big major changes. 
Uh, there were even, I guess, materials that were outright missing from the previous revision and things of that sort. Mm -hmm. So really nothing horribly controversial. Probably the most, uh, the biggest uh, news is uh, there's a movement in AMAC to put AMS 2750 on a somewhat shorter cycle than five years for uh, review of right. that spec <clears throat> so that we don't run into the long cycle that we just finished for revision F and then maybe we can catch problems or make improvements on a shorter cycle. So we'll, we'll see how that plays out. We'll probably have that come up in the next meeting here. Um, AMAC is uh, going to be meeting, what is it, next month? Yeah, it's yes, in April. A yeah. First, well, I think it's the second week of April. Yeah, the uh, various metals committees just uh, had a round of meeting. No, they have a round of meetings. You know, they just finished, excuse me. And they won't be meeting again until, I guess, November now, so, or later in the year. Um, and that's really all I have for me, Mick. What do you say, Robert? Um, what's impressive is we've got a lot of uh, specifications now that are being sent out to committee E and F for their re review, which means we're moving forward for a change instead of arguing. Okay. Um, and, and, you know, as Ed said, you know, we've, we've covered a lot of different minor issues on some of the specs and eliminated some of the, um, how do I want to call it, political comments that were made and moving. Uh, and some we just looked at and said, we're not going to make changes to it. It's fine the way it is. So we, we've made quite a bit of, of progress. The um, one second here. Um, one of the things is uh, uh, 2774 table three uh, for the Inconel. Um, okay. There's changes being uh, reviewed and we'll probably go out for balloting on that one. Okay. Um, and that's kind of it from my standpoint, unless you have a question about anything. Um, we we made some good progress in January. So Robert Ned, are there any any specs that you see coming up for review here in the near future? Members need to be apparent, aware of. Um, in um, terms of the process specs, uh, pretty much I think we're going to be in a stable state, don't you think, Robert? I do. I'm I'm looking at some of the comments right now, and I agree. It's it's pretty stable and. What's going to the upper committees means it's moving forward, you know, to get approved for, you know, uh, a new uh, spec release coming out, and pretty much everything uh, is 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 moving forward for a change. Uh, we we've, we've covered a lot of territory. Yeah, man. Ever since twenty seven fifty nine and twenty seven fifty got behind us in a big way, we there's not a whole lot roll, rolling through there, is there? Uh, the material specs are getting overhauled pretty good, but most of that's like right. editorial yeah. formatting, uh, yes. uniform formatting from one material spec. So no matter how you look at a at, at an SAE material spec, the layout is going to be identical for every one of them. So it should make it easier to find what you need to know, and uh, you know make sure you get drilled down to uh, the particulars. The um, they're they're you, I don't know if anybody has mentioned this before, but 6875 was recently replaced with an AMS four digit spec called 2761. And so uh, in the steel uh, community, uh, they're having to, uh, as they do material specs, they're displacing 6875 with this 2761 spec. So that's something you may wanna look at in your systems because Mill 68875 and AMS 68875 are all over the place out there. And uh, this may cause a little bit of heartburn at current contract review as you uh, educate your customer on the change and yourselves on what might be affected by what you do. So uh, Chad Simpson's yeah, asked, one of the is the team aware of the Aerospace Industry Association's movement to standardize aerospace quality flow down requirements along with the release of AS3100 supplemental standard for the aerospace engine quality management system standard? Anybody following that or, or seeing anything on that? No, I have not. I have to look into it though. No. All right. Well, that's a great question, Chad. We will definitely yeah. have, Bob, you have, did you, did you, did you have something? Okay, you're on mute, Bob. 
Yeah, I didn't know anything about that uh, Aerospace uh, Industry Association um, doing the slow down uh, requirement. So, yeah, I'm, that's news to me. Yeah, well, Chad, we'll put it on our uh, on our radar screen and start having somebody look into that and maybe and get a chance to report that on our next meeting for sure. Thanks for the question. Um, and then we're yeah, going to get yeah, into that. Of... Go ahead. Uh, one of the things that we're doing in AMAC is working harder to, when we have a spec that calls out or references another spec, we're trying to make sure that the terminology balances between the two different so that we're not going out in left field with another spec heading another direction. We're trying to get them more unified, if that makes sense. Right. Awesome. Well, anything else, Robert and Ed? Uh, that's it for me. No. Now we go from Thank the people who make the law to the people who enforce the law of the land of aerospace to NAGCAP. So uh, Bob Ferry and Ed Englehart, and then we're going to get into Joanna Lisa on the MMC report. So Ed and Bob, what, what's going on the latest? I know there was a lot of discussion on our committee call. So give us an update on what's going on with the uh, NADCAP and the checklist. Yeah, go ahead, Bob. Oh, uh, you're on mute, Bob. Got to mute, I'm mute, bud. There we go. There we go. Okay, so yeah, we did have a, um, we did have a lot going on with, uh, with the committee meetings and our call. Um, you know, certainly, uh, there were some big topics um, with AC 7102-5, which is for hard assessing and conductivity testing um, that most heat treaters have to uh, follow. Um, and that, that was, um, um, that was a, a uh, issue with trying to do uh, daily verifications, and there was some this, this um, uh, misinterpretation as to whether that was a requirement or whether it was a um, it was a recommendation by ASTM. Um, I mean, most heat treaters looked at it as a recommendation, uh, and NADCAP was uh, looking at it as a requirement. So, I know when when um, we had several discussions every time we met uh, as a group with NADCAP, um, and there was a lot of pushback from the heat treaters, which is very much appreciated because um, it finally broke um, one of the uh, representatives for uh, NADCAP, or NADCAP, which was Doug Schuler. he kind of championed the, um, the position to go talk to, um, go talk to the chairman over at ASTM and find out exactly how they intended the interpretation to be um, stated. So for the a AC 7102 slash five, I know that came back out for um, balloting and, and that's closed, but um, the wording changed from the way that they had proposed it to more in line with what ASTM thought, and that is they're, they're looking at it as a recommendation that you don't have to do a daily verification every single time you change that anvil um, on your hardness testing machine. And for a commercial heat treater, that is, um, that's a big, um, let me say, we're, yeah. yeah, it's, well, it's, it was huge uh, because every time you have to get a test, a different part, chances are you might have to change that anvil, whether it's a pinpoint anvil or a flat anvil or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And that was uh, not the intent of E18. So I thought we, uh, we got a good, um, interpretation from ASTM. I'm glad Doug went ahead and um, and contacted the right person and reported out to NADCAP what his findings were. So kudos to him for doing that. Any comments on that, Ed? Um, no, you're right. And it, it raised the larger issue. Uh, we know the ASTM specs are full of uh, mays as opposed to shells. And we have a problem uh, when we make these checklists. Um, it seems that the um, uh, subscribers and the uh, PRI staff have an idea of what they want to turn from a recommend to a shall. And it doesn't seem to be particularly consistent. So to that end, I've been tearing apart E18 and comparing it against the checklist to see what, um, 
what are all the recommend statements, what are all the shall statements, and what are all the questions that line up with each of those in the checklist. Well, it's turned out to be a lot bigger job than I expected. <laughs> but it's, it's becoming enlightening. I'm slowly getting some focus on it. And uh, I'm probably by the time we get around to the next meeting, we'll have something worth uh, looking at there to discuss and perhaps take back to uh, PRI management. Uh, PRI claims not to be a spec writing group, yet if you take a recommend out of a spec and you turn it into a shall, it sounds like you're making a requirement. And uh, we really need somebody from the top over there to say uh, how that should be addressed and make sure that flows down to their respective task groups. Well, that's all I have on 7102 slash five. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was, um, that's a big deal. And um, yeah, we'll see what they, what NADCAP says. Uh, it's a big deal as, to us. I don't know if it's a big deal to them, but we make it that way. <laughs> but as Doug Schuler mentioned uh, before in, in our discussions, if, if a specific um, aerospace company um, wants to uh, have that stated as a shell statement instead of a recommend, then that needs to go into the slash S um, uh, AC document instead of, yep. right, instead of putting it into the slash five, which everybody has to follow. Yeah, exactly. So, no, he's, he's totally right. And uh, so, a lot of for speaking up about it. It's really good for us and good be good for the auditors, frankly. Right, and I think that's what his concern was, is it was hard to audit. The way it was written, it was going to be very difficult for an auditor to audit it um, with us. So, certainly AC7102-8, the pyrometry, uh, that's all, have all the ballots are closed, that's all passed, and I heard that was going to NMC, so have you heard anything more on that? Uh, I haven't heard more anymore. It was it's, they usually take a couple of weeks to get those through ballot at NMC. So I'm thinking any day now we're going to hear you know that it got the blessing and it will be published. And once it's published, we got 90 days to comply. So uh, be forewarned if you uh, are a NADCAP uh, accredited supplier. Recommend you go to eAuditNet and follow things closely and watch those emails because they'll let you know when it happens and that'll start the clock for compliance. Right, and that's compliance to AMS 2750F. Correct. All right, complete compliance, right. Complete compliance to F. Right. Yeah. So one of our members had asked, any news on when the new checklist for AMS 2750 is coming out through PRI? Well, that, that's what we're waiting for any day now, basically. Yeah, that's the uh, 7102 slash eight. Yeah. So that's the one that we're, we just asked, uh, we're talking about. So we really do expect that to be out any day. I thought it was, I thought it would be out by April 1st. I think that's what their kind of tentative target date is. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then as, it, as Ed mentioned, 90 days from that is when 2750 becomes completely enacted. Ed, one of our uh, members has asked about AC 7000. Anything going on there? Well, Johanna might have information on that um, because that's coming out of the ICAP Management Council. Okay, we'll, we'll defer to her then when we get to her. Yep. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so anything um, else rolling in, in that cap, Bob? Yeah, I mean, they, they certainly had some um, OP documents that were sent out and back for um, ballot that were kind of bounced back and forth on 14 day ballots. Um, that was OP one 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 four appendix. Yep. Right. So um, that's all been closed, and it's back. Um, it's back to NADCAP at this point. So yeah, the confirmation ballot is up, so it doesn't close for a few more days yet. Oh, okay. Uh, we're we're okay there. And then there was the uh, virtual verification audit discussion, where. Uh, Right. This is really confusing to me, and uh, I've got to sit down with all the documents and lay them out and track a path. But you know, the uh, virtual verification audits are in case you cannot get an auditor into a facility and they're at risk of running out of their um, 
accreditation after all extensions have been granted. And that is that right, Bob? Yes. Um, and they would be like every quarter, every three months, you have to go through this, where uh, an auditor is assigned to you for eight hours of virtual auditing online, right. and uh, you know they they come back with the results and determine whether they're going to continue your accreditation or not. Sounds scary to me. I just seem figure out a way to have a real audit myself and just get it done with, but. Well, certainly they came out with the uh, virtual verification audits when COVID was in full bloom uh, throughout the country. And there were still many states that were not allowing travel. And so there were problems getting auditors to locations and problems with locations allowing auditors into their facility. Um, and hopefully um, all that's really, you know, easing up a little bit, certainly as the country starts coming back. But, um, but as Ed mentioned, it, it was a complex nightmare if you had to go through a virtual verification audit. It, because then once you're on that schedule, it's every three months, uh, you have to do right. eight hours of NADCAP auditing time. And the criteria for, uh, for failure would be the same as it would have been for like a one day audit. Um, now they relaxed that a little bit and Joanna was perfect with uh, going to the NMC and getting that cleared up because we got some misinformation uh, through NADCAP uh, that Joanna was able to clear up for us. Um, but still, there's a limited amount of findings that you can have in that eight hour audit and if you, if you get more than that, which I think is three majors, you fail the audit. Um, so, you know, an eight hour audit could fail you. And then now it's, you know, you're off to the races because that's like failing your one week NADCAP audit. Mm -hmm. Um, they send out messages to all the, um, uh, all the aerospace companies that you failed your audit and, and then everybody wants to rush into your facility and do their own audit to ensure that their parts are, are not going to be affected. I mean, it's, um, it would have been a disaster. Uh, so after hearing what all this virtual verification audit is, and then you still have to pay for these audits. Now it's not as much expense as a complete week of an auditor's time, but you still have to pay for all of this. Yep. And um, our takeaway on all of that, at least mine was when, when I was in that NACA meeting is, you got to do everything you possibly can to avoid having to go through a virtual verification audit. You have just got to do everything you can to get an auditor in your facility and do your regular NADCAP audit yeah. and avoid all of this. Yeah. Cause it, it, it just sounded like it was going to be problematic to me. Yeah. Well, it's good to hear that because in a sense, because I'm sure some people would think a virtual audit could be a better thing cause they're not in your plan. You know, it's probably going to be e somewhat easier. Um, but obviously listening to you, that's going to be far from the truth. It's going to definitely be something you're going to want to have that auditor do their regular audit. Yeah. Yes, because, you know, certainly when, when you're in the audit and the auditor's with you and he can see your facility, he sees how you operate, he, he's out on the shop floor, he sees what your people are doing, you know, he gets a totally different feel for your, for your right. business than when he's got to do it over the phone and you have to send him all these documents which was another um, uh, question because a lot of these documents are, you know, they're uh, ITAR and um, documents that you really can't send information across the airwaves, right? So, yeah, that so was an issue by itself was the uh, the ITAR export control stuff. They were trying to come up with a uh, online system where you could pass off that kind of information without hazarding uh, breaking the regulation. Right, right. So then you got cybersecurity that you have to deal with. It's, mm -hmm. it was, um, that's why I said it was going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. So I still recommend that if you are going through a NADCAP audit, get the auditor in. <laughs> Do right. whatever you can. Yeah, that's good stuff. Yep. And uh, just so you Thanks know, the uh, February uh, NADCAP meeting, the online meeting, the minutes have not yet been published. They're supposed to be published in the audit net by April 5th. 
So when, once they get published, if, even if you attended, but especially if you didn't, go read the minutes so you get an idea of what is going on uh, in this uh, world because it, it affects us all so, so very much. Right. Awesome. Great. Anything else, Bob and Ed? I think that does it. Yeah, that's all I got for, for NADCAP, um, right? All yeah. right, well, we're gonna, now we're gonna hear the real, the real nuts and bolts news, right? From Johanna, Johanna, how you, bring, bring it in and let's hear what's going on with MMC. Well, as usual, there's quite a bit of activity going on with NMC and I'm going to start by echoing Ed's recommendation. Of, I think it's imperative that suppliers avail themselves of the minutes not just of their specific heat treat task group minutes, but also for all the NMC minutes. And I'm going to add the agendas also. Um, you wanna look at those agendas before the meetings start. Uh, they're usually posted within a month or so, just to see what's on the NMC's radar. And then of course, once the minutes are posted, which as Ed said, well, they should be posted by April 5th, it's just as important and probably even more so that you make sure that you read the minutes from all of those meetings because there is a lot of information. Um, they actually get into quite a bit of detail in the PowerPoint presentations that are attached to those minutes. So things like the virtual verification audit and the virtual accreditation audit, um, those details will be in those PowerPoint presentations, and I just can't stress enough how important it is to make yourself aware of those activities and not just rely on my very brief recap here. Um, I'm also going to kind of elaborate a little bit on Bob Ferry's comments about the virtual audits. Um, that, that program was partially the result of the emergency planning subteam subcommittee of the globalization uh, committee. The staff engineer has the permission to allow four three month adjustments. I cannot use the word extension because I wanna make it clear that you're essentially borrowing on the time for your subsequent accreditation. <laughs> So if, let's just say your cert expired on 1231 and you get a three month adjustment from the staff engineer, you now have shortened the duration between audits to nine months. So you have to keep that in mind also because that's another thing that is not of benefit to suppliers because you may, once you get the auditor physically in your plant, you may two months later have another NADCAP audit because your CERT expiration date was not pushed back. So that's another critical thing to keep in mind. Um, those three months extensions that are granted by the staff or adjustments that are granted by the staff engineer also as of January require that the supplier submit what they call as a risk assessment survey, survey whereby you fill out a form that informs the staff engineer as to whether there have been any significant changes at your plant since your last audit. Of course, that risk assessment survey is uh, partnered with a charge. I believe it's $250. Don't quote me on that one. Um, so you have to keep a close eye on your certification expiration date and make sure you get that risk assessment survey in I would say a good 30 days before the expiration date so that the staff engineer has enough time to review that survey and then hopefully grant your uh, certification adjustment. Um, after 12 months, that's the point at which it goes to a virtual verification audit, the eight hours that Bob was referring to. Once you get past those 12 months allowed to the staff engineer, that's when the virtual accreditation audit kicks in. And in both cases, whether it's the virtual accreditation or the virtual verification audit, there is still some issue with transmission of restricted data. They don't have that platform established yet, so I think they're going to be hard pressed to have that in place in enough time 
to make this uh, a manageable situation. Uh, Bob is also correct that mode B failure, which is uh, the number of findings, is indeed two days. During the heat treat task group meeting, they, their PowerPoint said it was one day. And I, as Bob said, went back and did some checking, and it is indeed two days. Um, so I think that goes as far as I can for the emergency planning sub team. Again, that was under the globalization committee of the Management Council. Uh, for that same committee, we have a new activity for a new task group. First article inspection reporting task group, which they have performed one test audit, which resulted in 15 NCR with 22 observations. In addition to that, they currently have 16 fair task group audits scheduled. So that, how that's going to be applied across the aerospace industry as a whole, I'm not clear on. I've attempted to get clarification, but we all know how NADCAP operates, and so sometimes it's a little bit of a head scratcher. Um, for the metrics committee, the metrics committee is attempting to measure auditor consistency. And as part of their efforts, they surveyed all of the task groups and across the task groups, they found 20 to 25 different ways that the task groups are assessing auditor consistency. So you can just imagine how difficult it's going to be to measure 25 different variables. So we'll see what happens with that. Um, I'm not gonna go into any, any detail on metrics. Those are all available on eAuditNet. There's a self-service metrics utility that's on there that's actually pretty powerful and rather interesting once you get into the meat and potatoes of it. Uh, so the, because of a conflict with the heat treat task group meeting, I was not able to attend the standardization committee meeting. So you'll all have to get your updates from the agenda and the minutes on that. Um, there was a question on the chat about AC 7000. That's under the Continuous Improvement Committee. Uh, the effective date has been pushed back, I believe, to April 19th. Ed or Bob, is, am I correct on that date? I think that's the effective date, the newest effective date of 7,000, isn't that correct? I, mean, I, I knew it was an April date, but that's all yeah. I can recall. I believe it's the 19th. Um, interesting little tidbit, there was some issue with Ethics and Appeals Committee, which as a supplier, I'm not allowed to attend. But as a result of an issue under that committee, they have decided that there is probably going to be a revision to AC 7000 that will be addressed in the June meeting because by then they will have had a couple of months or they believe they will have had a couple of months of auditing conducted to 7,000 by then. And they will probably rev be revising AC 7,000 to include addressing fraudulent activity. I have no details on that, nor do I know the depth to which they think they're going to address it there, but I'm certainly going to keep my fingers on the pulse of that one. Um, Still in Continuous Improvement Committee, uh, I think we spoke last time about the Task Group Corrective Action, which is PG CAR, which the original intent of that was to identify issues that an auditor should have identified, but during an observation audit, the prime president discovered that there was something the auditor had missed that was going to be a corrective action issued to the task group because of their auditors uh, not finding something. They've changed that because, you know, NADCAP is just like the FAA, the world of acronyms. It's not going to be called the task group car anymore. It's now going to be called the NADCAP car. And so uh, there was a presentation on that also. And again, avail yourself of the minutes to see the details on that. Um, Let's see, planning and ops. There's some, again, major discussion about fraudulent activity due to a situation that occurred in the welding task group. So that was a hot topic. And then another hot topic is 
suppliers not allowing auditors to include non-mandating subscribers in the selection of the jobs for the job audits. And there was some heated discussion on that because the position of the suppliers has often been, if you're not mandating NADCAP, I have those, I have jobs for subscribers in my shop right now that are mandating NADCAP, and those are the jobs that the auditor should be auditing. But those non-mandating subscribers are not happy with that position. And yet, I don't know about your companies, but my companies have hundreds of approvals, and our focus will be on those subscribers that mandate. So this is going to continue to be a hot topic because these non-mandating subscribers aren't getting their way and they're not happy. <laughs> uh, steering committee. There will be a new eAuditNet platform launched around mid-2022. It will be cloud-based. They claim that it will be much more user-friendly and much more tailored to a specific person's role that they play in the NADCAP process, whether you're a supplier voting member or an NMC member, or an auditor, and so on, all the different roles. Um, there was actually a very lengthy PowerPoint presentation that what I thought went into very good and informative detail. So again, that will be attached to the minute. So make yourself uh, have your, make sure you get to the website and get those minutes. They should be up in the next week and a half or so. I found uh, another interesting little tidbit during the steering committee. We reviewed the supplier support committee survey, and I'm just going to touch on the six hot topics that were the results of the survey. Auditors feel they need to issue NCRs. I'm not surprised at that one. Auditors auditing commodities that lack experience, mainly heat treat and weld. <laughs> Auditors have different interpretations to checklist questions. None of us have any experience with that, right? Auditors writing NCRs on their opinions and not spec requirements. Staff engineers not helpful, ask for root causes that are not achievable or realistic. All of this, I'm sure, based on the smiles that I see on all of your faces, sound very familiar to you all. I suspect these will continue to be the hot topics in the survey. Again, the survey results are all on the PowerPoint, the steering minutes. And then to hopefully clarify the virtual verification audit and the virtual accreditation audit requirements and how that program has been implemented using three phases and all of the details that we've tried, Bob and I, to touch on and be as accurate as possible. There was a very informative PowerPoint in the steering committee. And so I think if you have questions, of course, I'd be happy to answer them right now. But if you want it straight from the horse's mouth, that PowerPoint will, I think will do a good job of answering your questions, but maybe not allaying your fears. And I think that's about all I have. So Jan and the Supplier Support Committee survey, I'm always interested. So what, as someone in the leadership of that, of, of the, at your level, what typically happens to those things that people not complain about, but make known that these are challenges for us? Well, what happens is Jonathan Heaven, the chair of the Supplier Support Committee, has a leadership team. That includes the communication team. Off the top of my head, I don't know what they all are. What they do is they take the survey results and they base their decision on what are the actionable items on the number of comments that they received on a specific topic. And then they take those that have the most let's put it this way, negative responses, and they take it to the appropriate committee, whether it's NMC or the SSC has actions that need to be taken, and they distribute those activities, and it may be a specific task group that they assign an activity to. So they take, you know, let's just say the top seven or eight, I know it's not 10, because there's always plenty, um, 
And they base their decision on what actions they will take on the volume of comments they received on a specific topic. And it may be just work at the leadership team level in the SSC. But I have seen many survey items raised to the level of NMC, and they will direct it to the appropriate NMC committee. You so this, audit, this you auditor consistency issue, I believe is a direct result of some of these auditor comments that come from the survey. And I believe that's why the metrics committee has decided they better start measuring this. Well, the reason I asked that is because I came to my first NADCAP meeting in 2000, I think it's 2008 or nine. And one of the big topics in that meeting in 2008 was <laughs> auditor consistency. So it's, so it's been there every, every meeting, every day, for years. Yes. <laughs> and slowdown's been another one. Yes. Exactly. Yeah. Slowdown and consistency. 20 years, 25 years, been the same issues over yes. and over. Ed and I met for the first time in January of 2000, of 2000 yeah. when the meetings were held in Tempe in the wintertime every year consistently when we had four meetings a year instead of three. And Ed, got on his soapbox about flow down and I turned to my colleague and said, I need to get to know this guy because <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> so here we are 21 years later yeah, still and it's still an issue. And jawbone in that one to pieces. Oh my gosh. Yes. So what I'm hearing in a nutshell from the whole crew is go out to eAudit.net, make sure in early April you download those minutes, download the agenda and download the PowerPoint and get to know them with all your heart. Is that correct, Jana? Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Because awesome. here's the thing. We're so focused on our specific commodity that we often lose sight of the bigger picture. And there are certainly things that are in the works that will affect all suppliers, regardless of task group. Right. And right. if you're not paying attention to NMC, and I worked for years to get on NMC and was giddy in 2018 when AQ asked me to be their rep, because <laughs> this is, an, this is an, a lot of good stuff and a lot of important things to know that are coming down the pike. Well, we as an industry are proud and glad that you're there, that you're bringing it to the <laughs> table here on this, on this forum and you're updating people on it. Because before we started doing this, People couldn't log in and just find out what's going on on the inside. So we're glad we got people like you, Joanna, and, and Bob and Ed and Robert and, and Stephen, who's bringing the news inside these committees to this forum so we can get people ahead of the game instead of finding out the moment an audit's due or when it becomes law. I got to do this. So this is a way they can at least prepare. So I appreciate all the in-depth discussion that you are giving to everybody. So looks like we don't have any, uh, any final, any, anything rolling on anybody's mind, a final comment anybody would like to make. If there's not any, that's great, but I always like to give one final comment if somebody's got something they think, somebody that we need to hear after hearing all, everything. All right, well, with silence being said, I will say members, thank you for tuning in. Panelists, thank you very much for your quarterly update. And I wanna tell everybody listening in, you wanna put April 14th on your calendar and you wanna to go to your marketing team five minutes after this call, and tell them they want to be on MTI's webcast on April 14th um, from 2 o'clock to 3 o'clock Eastern time because we're going to be having Jay Owen, who runs a company called Design Extension that actually works with some of our members on their digital presence, digital marketing. It's going to be a, a marketing uh, meeting that, you're going to, that they're going to want to be there. He's going to unpack how you build your digital marketing and the messaging you need to have to grow your sales. The biggest thing coming out of COVID for any company right now is sales regeneration and getting that sales up to meet your costs and stuff. And he's going to help you understand yeah. how you need to do that with your messaging and reaching your customers and growing your business. So they'll get an invite for that. But if you get it, make sure you pass it on. That's going to be a great meeting for your marketing team to be a part of. So thank you very much for being here and your time. And remember, you're not just strong, you're MTI strong. We will see you on April 14th. Have a great day. Great. Thank you, everyone.